Hello, NAFI members and flight instructors. This is John Niehaus, Director of Program Development for the National Association of Flight Instructors, welcoming you back to another episode of the NAFI More Right Rudder podcast, the podcast for flight instructors on the go. And today, this episode is actually sponsored by something near and dear to our hearts, the NAFI Summit. NAFI Summit 2023 will be held October 24th through October 26th of this year in Lakeland on the grounds at Sun and Fun. We're really excited. It's the first of its kind, and it's going to be just all about how to be the best instructor you can be. Um, Looking at uh, sort of our presentation schedule, we've got six key themes. We've got business of flight, instructor improvements, what went wrong, wisdom of wellness, cleared for flight, and tip top tech. Say that five times. Um, So I think that there's some really interesting uh, topics that we're going to be discussing, some really interesting discussions that uh, we'll be having with you, the flight instructor. And so we hope that uh, you'll find the time to join us. If you're interested in getting more information, go to NAFI Summit 2023 and be sure to join us between October 24th and October 26th. Now, Today's episode of the More Right Rudder podcast is a oldie but a goodie. It's actually an old mentor live that we did a couple years ago, and it's got Tom Turner's name on it, so it's got to be good. Tom Turner is the um, executive director of the American Bonanza Society's Air Safety Foundation, and he was generous enough to create a presentation called Why We Teach What We Teach. Now, I think that uh, you can kind of get behind the idea because why is a really important question. And it seems to be the theme of April because we also have a NOTAMS blog. If you go to nafinet.org, you can see a NOTAMS blog written by Chairman Bob Mater, or Chairman Emeritus Bob Mater, also saying, ask why. So anyways, with this presentation, Tom Turner talks about why we do certain things. And he's talking about VFR flight visibility, lazy eights as a commercial pilot maneuver, minimum safe altitudes, VMC demonstrations, all kinds of good stuff. And and Tom is one of the best instructors that I know. And he's got a laundry list of things that he's accomplished. Um, He's also part of the Flight Instructor Hall of Fame. And uh, he was 2010 National FAA Safety Team Representative of the Year, and he's gotten several other accolades. But uh, Tom is a wonderful guy, a great human being, fantastic instructor. And while we're talking about it, make sure if you are interested in um, Beechcraft Airplanes, uh, make sure you uh, visit the, the ABS website. American Bonanza Society and get more information on them too. So without further ado, why we teach what we teach with Tom Turner. Welcome, everybody. I'm Tom Turner. This week, we're going to talk about, this time, we're going to talk about uh, some of the things that we teach as instructor pilots and the reasoning behind them. Uh, One of the big challenges of teaching flight is to teach about FAA regulations. There are any number of regulations that apply to what we do in our airplanes, Part 61, Part 91, Part 43, all of these different regulations. Uh, For many of our students and our clients, This is the only government regulation they will ever have to read and interpret. And we need to help them with that interpretation. So part of what we're going to talk about tonight is is trying is is some things that you as an instructor might think about to help teach the interpretation of federal air regulations. Of course, uh, the primary thing that we do as flight instructor is to teach tasks and maneuvers in the airplane. Uh, The different uh, airman certification standards uh, have a long list of maneuvers and completion standards and criteria for 
uh, passing the check ride that we have to get across to people. And sometimes it's challenging to teach people maneuvers if they don't understand uh, why we're teaching those. So both in terms of regulation and maneuvers, we want to teach not only how to do something or how to uh, read something, but why are we doing things the way we do? Now, the reason we're doing that because, is because as flight instructors, we know that the highest level of learning is correlation. Uh, we don't want our students simply to read back what we tell them. Uh, we want them to be able to apply the maneuvers that they learn as part of their uh, preparation for check rides and the regulations they learn uh, to everyday flying and understand why we're doing the things we do. For the purposes of this week's uh, communication or this month's uh, discussion, I'm going to look at four different items that we teach at various points along a pilot's journey toward becoming a fully certificated and rated pilot. I'm going to look at four different areas. The concept of VFR minimums, the Lazy 8 commercial pilot maneuver, minimum safe altitudes, and for the multi-engine folks, the VMC demonstration. And think about not only what we present, but why we present these things. First, let's talk about VFR minimums. We learn a lot about VFR minimums, uh, uh, and one of the challenges even I have with advanced pilots who are coming to me to do flight reviews is to review those minimums with them, especially if a pilot is primarily an instrument pilot. They may not think about these things quite a bit, so we have to uh, try to reinforce that in our students all of the time. It's uh, complicated. There are many different classes of airspace. There are many different visibility and cloud clearance requirements. So there, have, uh, there are some mnemonics, mnemonics that we teach to help people understand or at least be able to read back what uh, the minimums are in air various different areas. One of the uh, mnemonics that we see quite a bit is called three 152s and five F-111s. Now, I'll submit that maybe we need to update this one a little bit because not very many of us fly in Cessna 152s anymore. Many of our students have never flown a 152. When this mnemonic was first created, everybody flew in Cessna 152s. Uh, but anyhow, three 152s. The other is five F-111s, and the last F-111 was retired from uh, U.S. military service over 20 years ago. So people aren't maybe as attuned to what that is anymore. But think about three 152s and five F-111s as a way of presenting the VFR minimum requirements. Specifically, three 152s ref, re, uh, refers to three miles of visibility, 1,000 feet above clouds, 500 feet below clouds, and 2,000 feet laterally from clouds. And in many, many cases, those are the VFR minimums. The five F-111 stands for five miles visibility, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, 1,000 feet above clouds, 1,000 feet below clouds, and one mile laterally from the clouds, which is the VFR minima in certain other cases. So using these mnemonics, we can come up with a table of the different classes of airspace and the VFR minimums that apply in each. So you look, for instance, Class A airspace has no VFR, uh, so it doesn't have any minima, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You go down through all of the classes of airspace, and sometimes they vary with uh, um, with uh, height above the ground or day or night or such. And that's as far as most of us get with it. Uh, most of us end up learning this from rote. You learn well enough, and then you apply whatever applies to you. Uh, and you don't really understand what is meant by these. So let's talk about the real purpose of VFR minimums. There are actually some clues in this table that might suggest what the purpose of these VFR minimums are. For example, Class A airspace has no VFR minimums at all because you've got to be IFR in oper to operate in that airspace. Now, interesting, I always thought this was interesting, in Class B airspace, which is some of the busiest airspace around, the VFR minimums are three miles uh, visibility, but merely clear of clouds. Why would it be just clear of clouds where all of these airplanes are flying? And then it reminds me, everybody has to be participating in services in Class B airspace, so there shouldn't be any surprises of where people and where the other airplanes are. Because everybody's under positive control, uh, they can get closer to one another in visual conditions and still be able to see and avoid. 
another set of clues applies to the class E and class G airspace. I won't read all of these here, but you'll notice that the uh, cloud clearance and visibility requirements vary primarily based on altitude above the ground. The closer you are to the ground, the lower the minimums are. The higher you get, the higher the minimums are. Now, there is some variation for night flight, but primarily the altitude determines what the VFR minimums are going to be. So let's think about this just for a minute. What are the VFR minimums really doing? Are they keeping us in contact with the ground? Is it helping us to prevent loss of control because of loss of visibility? No, frankly, VFR minimums aren't about loss of control. And they're not about flying into obstacles or controlled flight into terrain. The true purpose of VFR minimums are to keep us from keep us separated from IFR traffic. Thinking back to that chart, the more likely that it is that you are going to have some IFR airplane pop out the out of the cloud at you, the farther away you have to be from that cloud and the better the visibility has to be. The exception being the Class B airspace because everybody's talking to everybody, there won't be any surprises. And th the reality really is that uh, VFR minimums are not designed to ensure that we have a good horizon for our own spatial orientation. It's really about our responsibility to be able to see and avoid the perfectly legal popping out of the cloud IFR airplane and for the pilot of the IFR aircraft to be able to see us and avoid us if we're flying close to clouds or in relatively low uh, visibility. So uh, it's just a different way of looking at things. And all of these things that I'm presenting tonight are maybe, you know, they're my interpretation of some of these, but think about the different rules and regulations and, and read the clues that are in there. And, and try to figure out what it is we're really trying to do with them. And I'm convinced that with VFR minimums, it's not really for the VFR pilot as much as it is to ensure separation from the legal IFR airplane that zooms out of a cloud and needs to be able to see and avoid us and us them. Tom, that and, is so interesting and thank you. Uh, it helps us to think of, uh, think of the background when we think about that, you know, I've sometimes been guilty and I sometimes have instrument pilots who are guilty of flying um, on an IFR flight plan in VMC conditions. Right, right. You can avoid. I was doing something today with the student uh, I don't do very frequently and many of us do not do very frequently. I was flying VFR on top. Uh, it was an IFR clearance. I'm on top of a cloud deck doing some maneuvering. I'm clear skies above it, but I'm VFR on top. And even though I was on a current IFR clearance and IFR at the time, I still had to think about uh, other airplanes that could potentially come out of the cloud. So it's a, it's a somewhat unique way of looking at it. But if you look at the clues in the regulation, that's really what it's telling us. Let's stay far enough away from uh, low visibility areas so that we can see each other, even when somebody is legally flying through that cloud. Uh, the next area that I'll talk about, a commercial maneuver, is the Lazy 8. Uh, the Lazy 8, for those of us, uh, of course, who are instructors, we've already uh, made it through this maneuver. For, for any listeners who are uh, pursuing their commercial certificate now, it's something that you need to, to do. Uh, the Lazy 8 is one of several specialty high-performance maneuvers for the uh, commercial certificate. And uh, generally, it is a very gradually changing turn and a very gradually changing climb and descent so that you start and end on a given altitude and that the low points and the high points of the maneuver are at the, uh, the same point. The idea is generally presented as a smooth, gentle maneuver, and it is, that is something you learn to do so that you can prove you are able to do it on a commercial check ride. Uh, having worked in aircraft airworthiness issues for over 15 years, I think that maybe there's just something a little more behind the Lazy 8 maneuver as well. Now, first, the information that the FAA gives us on the Lazy 8 is very, very valid. It is a it, it's a, an exercise in coordination and airplane control over a wide range of airspeeds and altitudes. 
and it's designed to teach smooth operation in a regime when at no time are any of the control pressures constant. So we're constantly making small changes and making small corrections. And that's a big, important part of the Lazy 8. But I think there is something more to it. There's a concept called rolling Gs. Now, when you teach or think about maneuvering speed, maneuvering speed is the airspeed at the airplane's maximum gross weight where you can make abrupt control inputs and the airplane will uh, not exceed its design load. It's important to note that the um, maneuvering speed mentions that in certification rules is based on only making control inputs in one axis at a time. And that gets us back to the idea of what, you know, one of the other lessons of a lazy eight might be. Rolling G's is a phenomenon where you are rolling the airplane, you're changing the bank at the same time that you're changing the pitch and adding G load. And this can create an asymmetric uh, G load on one wing versus the other and can cause structural damage and sometimes even structural failure. Uh, about 10 or 12 years ago, there was a, uh, there was a rash of in-flight breakups of T-34 mentors that were used in uh, simulated air combat training programs around the country, and the in-flight breakups were in part attributed to pilots or participants in these programs who weren't trained aerobatic pilots uh, applying G-loads at the same time that they were applying uh, large rolling moments to the airplane, and it puts a twist on the wing spar and has uh, catastrophic uh, consequences. Uh, if you happen to uh, watch the Blue Angels or the Thunderbirds or any other aerobatic teams, look at them critically. They almost never roll and turn at the same time. They will pitch, then roll, or they will roll and then pitch, but they don't roll and pitch at the same time. And this is because they are specifically trained to avoid the phenomenon of rolling Gs. Now, where does that uh, apply to doing that Lazy 8 maneuver? A large part of the Lazy 8 maneuver, again, is to learn coordination and aircraft control over a wide range of air speeds and attitudes. But also, I think that there's a component of training pilots who are going to be commercial pilots and training the next generation of uh, pilots uh, that at least subconsciously from learning this, we learn you don't make large excursions in pitch and roll at the same time. Uh, the hardest thing to learn, I think, about doing the Lazy 8 is that it takes very small, gradual control inputs. And I apply that to the way I fly as well. I'm not going to pitch and roll at the same time. So the primary uh, job that we're teaching with the Lazy 8 is, of course, uh, to fly the maneuver itself. But I think at least part of it, part of the explanation is it's teaching us also if we're going to roll and pitch at the same time, we're going to do it extremely gently. Mm -hmm. Certainly, uh, a, a gentle maneuver. Tom, we have a couple of questions. Now, sure. if you could uh, shift gears okay. and uh, 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 take us back to your discussion about cloud clearance requirements. Okay. Uh, Glenn, Glenn has an interesting question. He says mm -hmm. he never understood why it was 500 below and 1,000 above. Why aren't they the same? Can you, can you comment on that? Well, at certain altitudes, they are the same uh, above and below. Uh, you know, that's one of the questions I've wondered, too. Why, why is it different? And you might even be able to make the case that if, if they're going to be different, they should be the opposite because an airplane's more likely to be descending rapidly out of the cloud than climbing out of the cloud. Uh, I think that uh, it's it, the altitudes where that apply. Most airplanes, even jet airplanes, are flying relatively um, slowly, so that might be part of it. But... The reality is I don't know the answer to that question. And, and it's an excellent question, Glenn. Mm -hmm. um, Tom, do you think part of it might be, and I'm just guessing here, yep. uh, that the bases are often more distinct than sides and tops? That could well be the case. Uh, it usually, and, and bases are also usually at least close to airports. They're measured for you, whereas the tops are not. That could well be the case, that uh, it, it's easier to maintain a 500-foot separation from a solid base than it is from a ragged top. That could well be the case. Yeah. Um, so on the same topic, uh, another mm -hmm. question from Stephen. Um, and, and this is interesting with our ADSB requirements coming up in January. Stephen says, I wonder how much ADSB will affect these clearance requirements. 
Um, have you heard anything about that? I've not heard anything about that specifically at all. However, ADSB was originally proposed as a means of completely eliminating ground radar control and all the costs associated to that. Now, uh, that's not realistic, and the FAA is going to be uh, eliminating some ground radar bases, but not all of them. But uh, originally, the plan was that we would all essentially control ourselves, whether IFR or VFR, and we would maintain separation because of ADSB. Uh, two things would have to happen for that. Uh, one would be that the uh, FAA would have to uh, essentially give up that that control, and it's it's not so much a control issue as it is a a matter of. Uh, being able to demonstrate to the uh, the public that we are controlling these airplanes. And the other thing is that it would require 100% equipage in ADS-B in capability. We would all have to be able to see everybody else, no matter what they were flying, in order to completely eliminate, for instance, VFR uh, cloud uh, visibility and cloud clearance requirements. Uh, the, the reality is that uh, a, a fairly large percentage of the general aviation fleet uh, probably will not be ADSB equipped at all, and many of them will be ADSB out only equipped, which is the minimum requirement for uh, compliance, but that doesn't give that the pilot with the ADSB out uh, capability. Uh, any cap capability to detect other airplanes. So I really don't think that there will be, uh, uh, given the current mandate, I don't think there will be any change to the VFR minima as a result. Interesting, interesting. Uh, so Tom, before we go to minimum safe altitudes, um, Temple has a comment. Um, he doesn't mm -hmm. form it as a question, but I wonder um, maybe if, uh, if you have some response here. Um, uh -huh. And he, he makes a good point. He said you can't see and avoid objects in less than one mile visibility. Mm -hmm. So he's not sure that he fully agrees with or necessarily <laughs> disagrees with the explanation of minimum visibility and cloud clearance requirements. Well, uh, it may be I'm off base there, but I really think that that's what's going on. And uh, it depends on the airplane you're flying. I mean, I fly airplanes that routinely cruise at three miles a minute, and I could make the case that you can't see and avoid adequately in three miles sometimes, especially right. if uh, somebody is uh, coming out of the clouds at five miles a minute toward you. But uh, I, I, I'm not saying that uh, what, what I am thinking is that one mile visibility doesn't assure you of enough uh, ground reference to be able to maintain control of the airplane either. So uh, there, there's something beyond just VFR minimums for purposes of making sure that we keep our airplanes right side up. And it certainly makes a difference if you're head on yes. or vectored or parallel. Absolutely. So. And thanks everybody for the questions and comments. Keep those coming. Sure. All right. Well, we'll uh, press on unless we have any more right now. Uh, not at the moment. Okay. Here's another one. And again, it's subject to interpretation, but the regulation for minimum safe altitudes. Uh, 91-119 uh, gives us a regulation, a series of uh, stipulations for minimum safe altitudes. Uh, first is, uh, uh, the first part of the regulation says that we cannot fly at an altitude at which any loss of power will cause undue hazard to persons or property on the ground, on the surface. So that's the first thing we need to be concerned about with minimum safe altitudes. That, so uh, that's the first clue we have to maybe what's being um, put forth to us in this regulation. At least we need to think about it. The second clue applies to uh, flight over, over any congested area or over any open air assembly of persons. Again, it's not a minimum altitude to necessarily keep us safe from something, uh, it's to keep us away from people and property on the ground. The third clue that's in this regulation is that we have certain stipulations if we are over other than congested areas. We can fly within 500 feet of uh, the surface or, or obstacles. And then the last clue, well, there are two other clues. The next clue is that we have even lower altitude minimums we can fly if we're over open water or sparsely populated area. Even then, though, we have to stay mo no more than 500 feet above any person. Lastly, in this regulation, 
helicopters and powered parachutes and weight shift aircraft have different regulations. So what, um, what might these clues be telling us about the real intent of the minimum safe altitude rules? Let's look at all of the clues at once here. The first is it's about what happens if we lose an engine and we have to make an emergency landing? Is it going to be hazardous, not to us, but to someone on the ground? The second one is we can't fly over a congested area or open assembly of persons. We're concerned with how many people are on the ground. Not so much what's safe for us, but how many people are on the ground. The third clue is other than congested areas, we can fly lower because there's less there are fewer people on the ground. And then when we get out over water or sparsely populated, all we have to do is stay 500 feet away from someone else. Helicopters, powered parachutes, and weight shift aircraft generally can land in a much more confined space if something goes wrong. So they are exempt from some of these rules uh, because they are not as hazardous, potentially hazardous as a fixed wing airplane to persons on the ground. So I, I thought for a long time, our minimum safe altitudes really keeping us from running into something or protecting the pilots of the aircraft or the passengers. I think a good part of the intent of minimum safe altitudes is about our responsibility to protect persons on the ground from something that might happen to it uh, because of our airplane. Uh, so teacher, you know, I, I get this a lot uh, where people will say, well, uh, I, I'm willing to take that risk. You know, the, the rule says this, but uh, I'm a risk taker and I wouldn't fly an airplane if I didn't uh, manage the risks like this and I'm willing to fly lower. Uh, part of the risk of flying an airplane, even if you're solo in the aircraft, is protecting persons on the ground. And in many cases, not just the two that I've cited, in many case, cases, the federal air regulations are oriented primarily to protecting the public from what might happen as a result from operation of an airplane. So, so teacher people, they have to adhere to these altitudes in part to protect themselves, but even more so as part of their responsibility to the public when they fly an airplane. All right. The fourth area that I'm talking about this evening is the VMC demonstration for the multi-engine pilots. Now, uh, for those of you who are not yet multi-engine rated, the, what we're talking about here is the speed or velocity of minimum control. And actually, it's most uh, uh, accurately the VMCA, loss of uh, uh, minimum control airspeed in flight or in the air. And this is a demonstration you're required to do as part of a multi-engine check ride and your MEI check ride. It demonstrates the fact that as airspeed decreases, the flight controls become less and less effective. And if you're operating on a single engine and you need to provide control input to overcome the asymmetric thrust of the engines, that as the plane slows down, eventually you will get to a point where you no longer have directional control of the aircraft. Full rudder deflection is not enough to overcome the asymmetric thrust when, you're at, uh, when you get too slow in the airplane. So the demonstration requires that you be at least 3,000 feet above ground level. As a multi-engine instructor and a person with a fairly well-developed sense of self-preservation, I think that's a good idea. Uh, the stipulated conditions for the maneuver are that the landing gear is up, the flaps are in whatever is the takeoff position for that aircraft. And that's a clue we'll come back to in a bit about what we're really trying to teach with a VMC maneuver. You slow the airplane to the minimum safe single engine speed or the VYSE speed, whichever is higher. The critical engine, which is almost always the left engine in our airplanes, unless you have... Um, counter-rotating propellers, in which case both engines are critical, and you can do it with each, uh, either one of the engines you want to. Uh, but the critical engine is at idle with its propeller windmilling, simulating a, a situation where you have just lost an engine, you have not yet feathered that propeller, and the good engine is at its takeoff power. So look at all of these conditions. You've just, what, what it's describing is you have just taken off, you've just retracted the landing gear, the flaps are still in whatever is appropriate for that airplane's takeoff condition, when suddenly your critical engine fails and you still have the other engine in its maximum takeoff power. That's the setup for the VMC demonstration. And uh, the old joke, of course, is the critical engine's the one that's still running, right? That's uh, right, exactly. 
because that's uh, the one that gives you the trouble. <laughs> right. For some, uh, for some of our uh, listeners who might be sure. working on a multi-engine or uh -huh. maybe you haven't uh, flown one in quite a while, um, we use this term asymmetrical thrust. Um, let's make sure everybody understands what we mean by that. What is Good. that? All right. Um, in your airplane, you you have in a multi-engine airplane, you have uh, presumably at most times an equal amount of thrust on either wing. Uh, both engines are working and they're uh, developing the same amount of power. Uh, if one engine fails or even a partial loss of, of power, you will have a lot of potential power on the good side, the one with the good operating engine, and little to no power on the other side. Not only do you have that, but if the propeller is still windmilling, there is a lot of additional drag. So you've got a lot of power on one side of the airplane, little to no power, and some drag penalty on the other side of the aircraft. So the thrust being developed is asymmetric. That's going to cause the airplane to want to diverge on all three axes, primarily roll, but it will also yaw and pitch as a result of a lot of power on one side, no power on the other. Fantastic. Thank you. Sure. All right. So we've done the setup. What happens next with the VMC demonstration? All right. The demonstration allows you to bank at least up to five degrees into the good engine. Now, this is sometimes misunderstood to uh, as the as the best bank angle to fly on one engine. And this is rather type specific. It varies quite a bit. For instance, I fly Beach Barrens quite a bit, and there's been a fair amount of flight tests done by Embry-Riddle and, and some other folks that show in that particular case, a Baron on one engine uh, actually gets zero side slip at about two to three degrees bank and not five degrees. But five is the maximum that you're allowed under certification requirements to, uh, the, the maximum that the manufacturer was allowed under certification requirements to establish what the VMC speed, the loss of minimum uh, single engine loss of control speed is. It can be up to five degrees. Uh, getting into the maneuver, just like uh, stalls, you're supposed to gradually work your way into the maneuver, slow at the rate of about one knot per second, and slowly increase the pitch attitude of the aircraft to cause the airplane to decelerate slowly. It continues to slow down, and as you do so, because of the asymmetric thrust, it's going to tend to want to yaw, roll, and pitch toward that dead engine. So you're gradually increasing the uh, opposite rudder to try to prevent this loss of directional control. Uh, eventually, you will get to a point where you have full rudder input, and there still is not enough airflow over the rudder to compensate for the asymmetric thrust, and the airplane begins to roll, yaw, pitch toward that um, toward that dead engine. And that's the point when you have reached VMC or the loss of control speed. The recovery from the maneuver, the next step of the maneuver, of course, is to recover from that. If the problem, if, as, as Mike said, the critical engine is the one that's working. If the problem is asymmetric thrust, you will fix the problem by reducing the asymmetric thrust. You reduce power on the good engine. Simultaneously, you'll lower the pitch attitude to lower the angle of attack if you're close to a stall speed, but also to increase the airflow. You'll increase the indicated airspeed and increase the airflow over the rudder. Therefore, you can stop the, the yaw. You can stop the, um, the roll. You maintain your heading within a, a certain criteria. And, of course, uh, in the demonstration, you're also looking to do this with a minimum altitude loss. There's no specific criteria for altitude loss, but you want to do it for, with a minimum altitude loss. So let's say we were going to go do the VMC maneuver. We're up at altitude. The FAA suggests that we have, well, actually requires that we have at least a 3,000 foot above ground level altitude to fly this maneuver. I like to fly it at 5,000 feet. I think the rule used to be 5,000 feet. Uh, the current rule says 3,000 feet of altitude. Well, when you gain altitude in an airplane that is normally aspirated, it doesn't have a turbocharger, the power available on the good engine decreases. And 3,000 feet above ground level, and if ground level is about uh, 1,000 feet or so, you're 4,000, maybe even higher above sea level, 
you will have significantly less power available on the good engine when you practice this maneuver. Therefore, the airplane doesn't have as much asymmetric thrust and it, you can maintain directional control at a slower indicated airspeed. There's just not as much tendency of the airplane to want to yaw, pitch, and roll into that dead engine. This is why flight instructors will uh, block the rudder input with their foot uh, to prevent the, the pilot flying the aircraft from being able to have full rudder authority available so that uh, the airplane will give you that indication of loss of directional control at a faster indicated airspeed. But when we practice these things up at altitude, even when we do the, uh, the trick of blocking the rudder, the airplane's divergence from controlled flight is not nearly as dramatic or as fast as it would be if the engine was developing a greater amount of power. What uh, this maneuver is really talking about is what happens when we are at a lower altitude, when we're taking off in the airplane. If we're down toward uh, sea level altitude, and you're close to altitude, you've got quite a bit more horsepower available. So let's look at what you, you might have going on just as you're taking off. The gear might even still be down in the airplane at this point. The real world uh, situation we're looking at here is we're at a low altitude where we have a great amount of horsepower available on the operating engine. And when one engine dies, we have a large asymm asymm asymmetry of thrust. There's a lot of power on one side and no power and drag on the other down close to the ground because of this much greater amount of thrust available, the airspeed will diverge from controlled flight at or about that red line speed. Uh, as the plane, if the plane is lighter, it will uh, occur at a slightly lower speed, but uh, you're much likely to get an actual real world divergence from control uh, close, closer to sea level, closer to the ground than you do when we fly the airplane and you will likely see this loss of directional control if you lost an engine just after takeoff uh, at a relatively high speed, somewhere close to that published VMC speed, that red radial speed. Let's take that airplane back up to altitude and see what's happening when we practice. First, because of the lake lack of asymmetry, the actual speed at which directional control will be lost is lower. Um, you can fly at a slower airspeed because there's less tendency of the airplane that you're trying to overcome with rudder input. You can fly at a slower airspeed and still maintain directional control. VMC speed decreases with an increase in altitude. Uh, unfortunately, stall speed in this configuration does not. And it's possible that the airplane will stall before you actually get this indication of a loss of directional control. And that's the real hazard that you have to prevent as an MEI when you're presenting this presentation in flight. Uh, you block the rudder not only to make the, thing, make the uh, maneuver happen more quickly at a faster speed, but also so that you don't accidentally stall the airplane on one engine. In some models of multi-engine airplane, that may develop into a flat spin that might even be unrecoverable in some cases. So it's a, a very distinct hazard of performing this VMC maneuver. So we have to think about that. When I present the uh, VMC maneuver in airplanes, I brief the recovery happens at the first of any one of these three items. The first is the loss of directional control as a result of asymmetric thrust and my blockage of the rudder. If they start to sense that, you know, if they are at what they feel is the maximum rudder deflection, and the airplane starts to diverge from a directionally controlled flight, that's when you chop both throttles, you, know, you reduce the power, well, the one's already back, you chop the throttle on the good engine, lower the nose, reduce the angle of attack, increase the airflow and recover. The second indicate, the second situation that would cause you to automatically do that recovery, let's go back to the previous slide, the second situation in the briefing is the first sign of any stall indication. Um, one more ahead of that one. The um, advance the slide one, please. The second is a stall warning or stall indication. If you are practicing this maneuver and start to feel a buffet, or you hear the stall warning horn, or anything that tells you that the aircraft is beginning a stall, immediately execute that recovery. Don't wait for the loss of directional control. You 
chop the throttle, lower the angle of attack, increase the airspeed, and, uh, re and regain directional control of the aircraft. The third situation that would require the recovery, the way I brief it, is any indication that you have a decre decrease in power on the good engine. Now, that's going to remove the asymmetry, but now we've got some sort of engine problem. We're going to exit this maneuver, uh, get the power up on the good engine eventually, and take care of things from there. So when you are uh, briefing the VMC demonstration, one thing to think about is that in the, in the demonstration environment, you have a hazard of stall, a single engine stall. So brief that we are going to do the recovery at any one of these three things, loss of directional control, first indication of a stall, or any indication of a loss of power on the good engine. All right, let's move on from there. <clears throat> Simultaneously do all of these things that I mentioned, and that allows you to stop the yaw and maintain heading. And again, you do it with a minimum altitude loss. Let's come back to uh, what we're really trying to teach in this maneuver. The VMC demonstration, and it's small print here, and that's fine. You can look it up. But if you look at every stipulation in the ACS, for the uh, criteria for performing and satisfactorily demonstrating the VMC, they spell out the maneuver as we've described so far. In other words, they tell you, do this, do this, do this, do this. You get into the maneuver, you recognize the loss of directional control, you get out of the maneuver. This is what I sometimes refer to as a, uh, a check ride circus trick. A lot of people don't think beyond what the maneuver tells them to do, and you, you teach a maneuver so your student learns the maneuver so that your student demonstrates the ability to fly the maneuver. And we really don't get to the next step, the correlation step. What is it we're really trying to teach? It's not a check ride circus trick. There is a very real lesson that we're trying to teach with the VMC. The lesson in the VMC is that in any single engine operation, not just a demonstration for a check ride, in any single engine operation in a multi-engine airplane, at the first sign of loss of directional control, any sort of stall warning or indication, or decreased power on the good engine, immediately recover using that VMC recovery technique. Uh, see it in NTSB reports and uh, uh, all of the time where a, a multi-engine airplane is taking off, has an engine anomaly or an engine failure on takeoff, and in that initial, in, in the attempt to climb out on one engine, the pilot starts to lose directional control. So let's look at how the lesson applies to losing an engine on takeoff. You're, um, you lose engine, you may even feather the propeller, you attempt to climb on one engine, but maybe you climb a little steep or the airplane's very heavy or the density altitude is above the airplane's uh, single engine service ceiling or any one of these factors combined. For whatever reason, in your attempt to climb, you get to a point where you're starting to have difficulty maintaining directional control of the aircraft. This is the beginning of what's called the VMC roll where a multi-engine airplane on losing an engine on takeoff might continue to roll over and pitch down into the ground. What we're really teaching in the VMC demonstration is that if you lose an engine on takeoff, even if you've got the propeller feathered, if you can't maintain directional control, or you hear the stall warning, or something is going wrong with the other engine, pull both engines to idle, lower the nose, apply the rudder input necessary, do the VMC recovery technique. You might end up belling it into the ground. You might have the same impact of having lost an engine in a single engine airplane, but the idea is to maintain control of the aircraft. If you lower the pitch attitude and you maintain directional control, you had the best chance of survival if you do impact the ground. And it may be after you've regained directional control, you can gradually feed the power in while maintaining airspeed to maintain uh, controlled flight and climb out as well. So one of the two lessons of the VMC demonstration is 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 not just to pass the tech ride. It's what happens if I lose an engine on takeoff 
and I can't, I start to lose directional control or I hear the stall warning horn. We should be spring loaded to immediately do the VMC recovery at that point. Another situation that, that uh, occurs far too often in multi-engine uh, accident scenarios is something has happened to an engine in flight. The, the airplane may be in cruise flight and the engine fails or the pilot shuts down the engine in a precautionary shutdown for some reason, then begins an approach, whether it be, whether it be an instrument approach or a visual approach. And um, uh, in the process of maneuvering for landing, gets the airplane too slow, loses directional control and has a VMC rollover uh, during the, uh, well after they've handled everything properly with the, uh, with the engine out. That happens very, very frequently where a pilot feathers a prop, prop even and loses directional control on the way back to an airport. So the other lesson of the VMC demonstration is that uh, if you've lost an engine and you are coming in to land, whether it be a visual approach or an instrument approach, and at any point you start to lose directional control of the airplane, you've got to do the VMC demonstration recovery technique. Reduce power, lower the angle of attack, increase the airflow, add rudder as necessary, and, and recover from it. Uh, again, it's, it's disheartening I, you see it many times in accident reports where the pilot of a multi-engine airplane loses an engine at some point at altitude, but then loses directional control in the process of coming into land. Uh, if you start to lose directional control, do the VMC recovery. I think that's what we're really trying to do, not just to teach a, a circus trick so that uh, we can pass a check ride. We're really trying to establish a habit pattern that if you cannot control the uh, the direction of the aircraft, take care of the asymmetry and get it back under control. So I've I've done basically my interpretation of four things uh, about why we teach what we teach. I really don't like the idea of teaching something, whether it be a regulation or a maneuver, simply uh, for the purpose of being able to echo back what that regulation is or uh, how to fly that maneuver. I like to teach the why of what we do so people understand um, the correlation between the maneuver or the regulation and uh, normal day-to-day -day and em emergency operations of our airplanes. Uh, in doing this, I've uh, ap admittedly applied my own, uh, my own interpretation on four different things, two different maneuvers and two different regulations among the many, many items that we teach. So I've talked about VFR minimums as they apply not only to uh, us as a VFR pilot maintaining control of an aircraft, but also the separation requirement between us and IFR aircraft. Uh, the Lazy 8 not only as a performance maneuver to uh, teach precision control of the aircraft, but also as a reminder that uh, if you're going to change pitch and roll at the same time, you have to do so very carefully, very cautiously. I've talked about minimum safe altitudes, which if you read the regulation, is much more about the people on the ground than it is us in the airplane. And then lastly, the real world application of the VMC demonstration. It's not something you do just for a check ride. It's a habit pattern that you should carry with you for your entire life so that if you ever find yourself on one engine and cannot maintain control of the aircraft, you know how to recover. Uh, my challenge to you is maybe you don't uh, take my specific interpretations, but look at the regulations that you teach your students, look at the maneuvers and ask yourself why we do them. Try to present the why of these maneuvers so your students understand them and they can correlate them to their day-to-day -day flying.